All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to our session today. We're doing a bit more of a um, yeah, a more more of a case study rather than, I guess, um, sharing, sharing knowledge. I think we're you know we're as students we're interested in sharing our experience in the Students as Partners program at Deakin, um, and we're basically running an AI project which we'll kind of talk about a bit, a bit about experience running that, working with staff, academics, and other students to bring you know a bit of a um, a bit of a student created resource. Um, so yeah, I'm Will. I'm a current uh, double degree student of business and law at Deakin University. Um, I'm in my third year out of out of many years to go. Um, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Rohan Mathra. I'm doing a Bachelor of Cybersecurity at Deakin. Awesome. We might make a start. So this clicker thing is like... Not working. All right. That's one, that's one too many. All right. Yeah, so we put together a bit of an agenda. So essentially, um, we don't want to spend too much time talking about the project per se. We more so decide we want to share our experience as students. So, you know, as practitioners, you have a bit more of a, a sense that when students participate in these students as partner projects, what we actually experience, what we actually feel, um, some of the road, the barriers we, we face. Um, so we'll talk a bit about the project we're doing. We'll, talk, we'll, we'll do a brief overview of Gen AI because, um, you know, just to make sure everyone's across what we're actually talking about. We'll do a bit of work on um, student collaboration and partner participation. So looking at what we've found throughout our work, um, looking at future directions of the project. So our future um, role in partnering to help finish this project off. And hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. So um, make sure you save up some questions, but I'll hand it over to uh, Rohan to talk about Gen AI. Thanks, Will. Now, how many of you have actually used Gen AI or know what it is? I didn't actually imagine that there would be anybody in this room who doesn't know what it is. I really um, like this thing that Ryan mentioned. This picture is, by the way, I generated. And he used that metaphor that AI is both an elephant in the room and a storm on the horizon. And a lot of people know that AI has been um, around for a while now, but they don't actually realize, realize the magnitude of it. Just to, think, uh, to put things into perspective and into numbers, how many of you know what NVIDIA is? Yeah, so most of you would not uh, not know what NVIDIA is 20 years ago because it was not big a company. The only people who would know what NVIDIA was, was were gamers because they made GPUs. NVIDIA was a normal company, had about a two, $300 billion valuation, to, and that's three years ago. That was before the launch of ChatGPT. And uh, just FYI, when um, AI needs data centers and data centers need GPUs. So when ChatGPT was launched uh, and it blew up, so did NVIDIA. And the company went from being a $300 billion company to being a $3 trillion company today. And NVIDIA is the most valuable company in the world now. It's worth more than Apple, Microsoft, everything. And that's all because of AI. Every company is investing so much into AI and you can see AI about everywhere. So just to support that metaphor, it is uh, both the elephant in the room and the storm on the horizon. Now, what is generative AI? What do you think generative AI is? What do you think generative AI is? Anyone? No one wants to volunteer? Yeah. Yeah. That's literally, that's all it is. It's it's basically it's basically a chat bot that can generate it images for you, just about any sort of content that you, that you could use. That's all AI is. So there's not much to understand there unless you want to go into the technicalities, which I probably wouldn't know myself. Um, but let's talk about our story. How did we get into the, this project? About a year or so ago, we were at the University of Sydney. So it's funny how it actually started at University of Sydney. We were here for an AI and education conference. ChatGPT had been out for about six months. By this point, everybody knew what ChatGPT was. Universities were starting to get concerned that uh, they would lose their um, audio accreditation because their graduates won't meet, meet learning outcomes if they could not um, if they were not studying and they could not ensure that the students were meeting academic integrity. And at the time, about everybody was using it, and so universities also did not know if they should promote it or they should just ban it. 
So that that, that was probably about what the first conference was about. Should we promote it or should we ban it? How should we go about it? What it what is it going to be in the next five years? Uh, that was a really insightful conference for us as student leaders because we came knowing about everything that we knew about AI. And then we got to hear the perspective of other student leaders and academics from all across Australia. We even back to Deakin with those insights. And we realized that Deakin was one of the only universities out in the entire Australia who was not one of one of the few universities that were actually doing something about it. So a few months after ChatGPT came out, Deakin had a gen generative AI advisory group through which we actually came to that conference. So when we actually went back, we got to thinking that all these insights that we have now, what do we do with them next? Is there any way that we can um, give those insights to more people and actually create an impact? So about that same month, I was uh, doing a business and law, a unit from the business and law faculty, and I'm doing a group project. I use ChatGPT for something. One of my teammates sees it. He goes and tells the other teammates, and they kick me out of the team because uh, for them, ChatGPT was taboo. AI was a taboo. And just FI, I wasn't cheating. I was just tr getting to explain something to me that I did not understand like a three-year-old. So that's what, what I used to use ChatGPT for, but it was such a taboo that people were scared of using it, especially in the business and law faculty. I was studying cybersecurity and I was in the faculty of science, engineering and build, build, in, build environment. And people in that faculty were a lot more curious. Professors were a lot more open and they wanted to promote people to use generative AI. They just did not define a clear line between when you're using it to help yourself and when you might be violating academic integrity. Now, people in SEBI were willing to take that risk. They use AI for a lot of things, from um, understanding how, how to code, what this code meant, a lot of other things. People in other faculties, however, we found were not as uh, willing to take those risks because they did not understand the tech or anything, or they didn't know anything about it. So Will was... Um, Doing, Will was also in the business and law faculty and in SEBI because he was doing a double degree. So I went to Will and I asked him that, do you, do you feel the same that people don't actually know enough about it and they're just dismissing it and they're scared of it? And he actually got to reflecting on his past experiences as well. And he, he came to the same conclusion. This was about the time that we were in that student advisory group. And there happened to be a promotion in that group for student initiated projects um, by equity first uh, equity for students as students as partners at Deakin. Uh, it's a part of part of the Deakin portfolio. Cassandra here is our project uh, coordinator. Um, so we got to see that and it was basically a student initiated project where you could work with staff. So it was a staff student partnership and you could actually get the resources that you would need to work on, the, work on that project. So we applied for it, not knowing much about it. We applied, we got it. And since then we've actually been able to speak with so many students through the resources that we were able to get, um, get through Deakin. We got to speak, I don't want to use the word research because we have realized that when you use the words research in a university environment, it raises a lot of red flags. So when you use the word research, you have to go through ethics approval, a lot of things. So let's call it focus group or just collecting data. So to collect data, we went on a lot of, we went on some coffee catch-ups. We spoke to a few people on our own uh, and through um, student as partners and the student initiated project funding, we were able to also organize a survey where we got to interview a lot of people. We interviewed people who were graduates, people who were in their master's degree, first years, last years, to get everybody's perspective. And we realized that some people, while they were scared of it, a lot, some other people were using it a lot more. And our focus was in the business and law faculty. But we did speak to some people in SEBI as well, just for, com for a comparison perspective. We found out that, that people in business and law were genuinely scared of using AI because uh, their professors were not really adapted, not too adaptive of it. And uh, a lot of professors didn't actually promote it or give clear guidelines about where you might be violating academic integrity. Now, me and myself and Will were more comfortable with that because at the first AI conference, we realized that universities at that time did not have the capability to detect generative AI. I'm not saying we plagiarized anything since then, but uh, I'm just saying we were a lot more comfortable knowing that they couldn't actually detect it. I still don't think that can. Yeah, I don't think this still can. Um, but through that project, we speak, spoke to a lot of people and we actually found out that people from business and law faculty were more vulnerable. And when we got to thinking, uh, we realized that while it might be okay to not for them to not use generative AI at university, it's going to be different in the real world. If you have picked up any AI article in the last few years, if you've invested in the stock market, you must have seen at least one article where some company is automating something. And if you haven't, let me tell you that about every company is automating as many things as they can. And I saw an article that uh, that said, quote, AI might not take your job, but somebody that knows AI will. 
knows how to use AI. When And when I say somebody who knows how to use AI, I don't mean like a technical person, somebody who just is able to give the menial tasks to AI, get it out of, out of the way and focus more on things like critical thinking. So that was our story. Now, what is the role of generative AI in learning? So AI is playing a significant role in reshaping education by offering more personalized, efficient, and accessible learning experiences. With AI-driven tools, students can receive tailored learning paths that adapt to their pace, strengths, weaknesses, and learning pace. Uh, if you were in, the, in that room before where I, where I had a question for Ryan and I wanted to ask for his perspective, uh, and he he spoke a bit about how he thinks like it thinks that it's a great thing how you could use use for, for personalized tutoring stuff like that, which is actually a really big thing that AI, that AI can do. I personally use AI as a tutor to teach me things that I don't understand. Now you can think of AI in a way that if you use it the right way, it might be a it might be a great tool and can help you help you a lot. But if you use it to do things like plagiarizing, you're not really getting enough out of the university experience. You won't meet your learning outcomes. And people do that. But our focus is what we are looking at is that AI could potentially help students receive tailored learning paths, have, have personal tutoring. They could use, teachers could benefit from AI by automating tasks like grading, attendance, tracking, and administrative duties, giving them more time to focus on direct student engagement. AI-powered virtual tutors provide additional support, offering explanations and resources outside the classroom. Additionally, AI can analyze student data to predict learning outcomes, helping educators identify, identify when students may need extra help, allowing for timely interventions. This makes learning not only more personalized, but also more inclusive, opening up opportunities for a wider range of learners. A lot of, and when we come to the, the topic of inclusive, inclusivity, everybody can use AI. And a part of this project was uh, was a focus on inclusivity because we already knew people in SEBI or science engineering and environment were using AI, but business in law wasn't. So while that great tool that could help them in, in enormous ways was out there, they were not aware of it. So this project was also focused on inclusivity to actually bring them in the loop and teach them how to do it, which is why we're currently working on making a guide on how to actually use uh, AI without violating academic integrity for the faculty of business and law. So yeah, thanks for that, Rohan. I think that was a really good insight into the whole story behind it so far. I'll quickly just go over a bit about the project, but first I'll just talk about specifically in business law, um, the, the uses of AI really we're looking at are related to future, so the future um, job market. So you know, if you if you study something like marketing, creating copy with uh, with um AI, if you're studying such something like data analytics, how can you use AI to um, analyze data, modify it? Um, so a bit about the actual project itself, I'll... Yes, um, I think we already saw that one. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Why that's not... I swear. Yeah, so basically, the, so in the business law faculty, on our um, LMS, our learning management system, we have a uh, online like we have a, basically a toolkit for the business law faculty, and there are other student made you know pieces of work in there. So there's, there's like an Excel skills guide, legal research guide, and we're basically adding a specific business law guide um, of how to use AI specifically in business law because the universities release general information, but you know from what we've heard, a lot of people want faculty specific advice and guidance. Um, so I think now will be a good chance to really talk about the you know the actual collaboration and participation as students about what we've got to be what we've been able to do um you know as students to make real change in the university space so um so basically there's kind of three main pillars to what we've been doing so we've, we've so we're partnered with cassandra who runs the um, equity first students partners at team at deacon so um they run a lot of different programs um one of them is a student initiated program. So that's all HEP funded. So higher education participation um, program fund. Um, and it's for equity first students. So it's essentially looking at, you know, people from low ECS backgrounds, um, people first coming to uni, mature age students, um, people who may be less likely to be engaged in university. That's where that funding goes. Um, so we've done a lot of collaboration with different people. 
So, um, for example, yeah. So, firstly, we've engaged with as part of the project with fellow students. So, we've been looking at because essentially, in order to build a guide for students, you got to ask the students what they want. Um, I think often, even even us, I think. We get, we get carried away with the fact that we're students sometimes and we can just go and make this guide without consulting anyone. But it's really important for us as well to remember that there's, that we're, we're, we're two people out of like the thousands of students who might, and we're, we're two te we're, we're very technical people as well. We both study technical degrees. Um, so we need to work with directly with students to understand what their current knowledge is and work out what they want. Um, so, you know, we did a range of focus groups, we did some interviews, um, and also even talking to our friends about how they use generative AI. I think that was a really, really insightful. I think the, you know, the benefit of being students and doing this is that students are very honest with other students about how they do things. They don't, you know, if it's an academic, they might think the academic's gonna like snitch on them or something, or they're gonna, you know, if you tell the academic that you've done something um, that might be considered academic an academic integrity violation, they're gonna tell on you. But I think being students, it gave us that, different perspective of, you know, we're in the same boat as all these other people. We kind of want the same thing as them. Um, and I think that allowed us to really um, get honest insights from students, especially in a topic that's very heavily about academic integrity. And, you know, it can be so easy to just use these tools to output an assessment. Um, so, you know, we really wanted to help students as best we could in that sense. Um, so we also worked with academic and professional staff. So in our actual project team, so there's Rohan and me who are the student leaders, but then we also have um, a few people from the actual business law faculty who are kind of project partners, and they, they're kind of project sponsors in the West. They help us out with connecting with other staff members, um, getting what we need. Um, they also help get us get us here. Um, so we work very closely with these staff members, and I think overall they've been really good for us. Like they've really helped us, um, and we've also been able to meet so many other academics through them. So. We've been able to run several interviews with academics, you know. At first, I think it was quite intimidating when you know you're you're just, you know, you're a third year student, no degree, and then you're just going meeting these people with PhDs and you're asking them questions about how they use AI. Um, and it feels a bit like, well, I feel like I shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. Like, um, and I think as well, some academics also lack trust in students. And, you know, they're not going to tell us the full what their full thoughts are because um there is that professional relationship there. But I think Overall, though, it was quite insightful to see how open academics were to sharing their experience with generative AI. I mean, how they use it in class, what they tell their students, if they teach it or not, like um, what their thoughts are on academic integrity and where they draw the line. I think that was very um, insightful in terms of working with academics. Um, as with anything, there have been, I think, a lot of challenges, but also a lot of learning experiences. So I think, you know, for Rohan and myself, it's given us a big opportunity to practice a lot of different skills. So, you know, getting some real world project experience, project management skills, you know, working in teams. I think it's as much as it benefits other students in the university, the content we're making and what we're doing. It also, I think, equally benefits us. You know, we are in, we're, we're employed by Deakin um, and we also get it's basically on the job training in a way. And we get to do so many great things. We get to try new things. We get to push boundaries. And I think that's, you know, it's really helped us. Um, in terms of building up ourselves, personal growth, and you know, just learning skills that I think you might not really learn if you're just doing a degree. I think the practical this practical experience has really like kind of helped shape um, the stuff we do, and I think you know it's given us a a bit of an identity in a way because I think we kind of started with the whole Gen AI craze at the start of university, and we've kind of come along for it. And you know, at Deakin, it feels like our, our contributions are very much valued um, by people from all over the place. Um, so then, you know, there have been challenges in the learning experience. I think there's ups and downs with every project, but I think it's been a great learning experience for us. And I think it's also, oh, yeah, sorry. it's also kind of given us, um, made us more comfortable with <clears throat> regularly learning. Because one thing that we were afraid of is that if we make the guide today, <clears throat> given on how fast I was changing, it could be outdated by next week. And it, it it's taken us almost about an year to make this guide because we we're also uh, involved with other things at Deakin and outside. So we were just not full solely making the guide, but it took us about a year and we're due to finish at the end of October. And the one thing that we were uh, afraid of is that as soon as we finish the guide, it might be outdated soon as well. 
So we have constantly been learning and updated the things that we know. And it's um, we have been we've been seeing on top of all the AI craze, everything that's happening, what's new, what's not. And we've been trying to condense the things that might that are less likely to change. And we're currently also in discussions to actually have this AI guide updated regularly. And we're just trying to decide how long we want that updated based on how fast AI is changing. And it's helped me. Um, I recently went to a job interview. And this this job, and if I think of it as a job, it has allowed me to feel like I'm making a difference or making an impact. It might be not a good, not a really big one. It's definitely a good one. Uh, it might be not a big one because it's just for one faculty at the moment, but it's definitely something that if I go and sit in a job interview, I can talk about. Yeah, I think that's very, um, very insightful. I think this this helped me land my job as well. Um, so I think kind of to sum up, we're looking at kind of so impact future direction. So I think, you know, one of the things we looked at when we first started putting this guide together was, you know, one of the one of the big things we look at, I think, especially with HEP, is mental health of students. And I think generative AI was such a um like such a big thing for people. People were like, I don't know what to do. I'm just stressing me out. People other people are using it and I can't use it. Mm. And it's like, what am I gonna do? So I think, you know, there were so many long term benefits and I think skill development for just all the students involved. Um so I think, you know, it's gonna be great for technical skills because I think it's important, you know, I think at Deakin, we're very much about graduate ready employees. That's like one of our like taglines um, or graduate or something along the lines of that. Um, graduate ready employees, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, giving students those technical skills. And I think, you know, as, as we know, digital literacy is already built into curriculum. And I think, you know, building up these, building these guides, even if it's the first step, I think it's a, it brings momentum to what we do and brings momentum to the whole AI um you know craze in a way so i think it also helps improve employability because if you can if you can if you can be like oh i can help automate these tasks or you know i might not know something but i'm very independent and i can work out how to do it with the help of gen ai um i think that is going to be very um and fun. i think personally ever since generative ai has come out <clears throat> there's not one thing i felt like i couldn't do if you came up to me and told me to build an app and I wasn't even a technical person, but I knew how to use generative AI, I knew how to write proper prompts, I could make you an app by the end of the week. So it's really empowering, empowering to feel uh, that you can just learn about anything from this one source of information. And the biggest thing is that it's free for the most part, like you can pay for a premium version, but generally it's free. So it's includes that anybody can use it as long as they're comfortable with new technology. Yeah. Awesome. Um, finally, I guess, you know, just for the, for the future, um, I think we're, we're really on the drafting stage now. So we've done most of our um, user insights and hopefully near the end of October, we'll have it going really. But I guess, you know, there is a lot of scope for further stuff in the coming years, depending on other, if other faculties are interested or, you know, universities in general want to create more advice. I know there's been a lot of push, especially in business law to make business law specific advice. Um, so yeah, I think um we got like three minutes before lunch. So if I mean if anyone has any questions, we're happy to talk about our experience. Um, especially I think as students, because I think um as students being a student as a partner, I think you know it can be very insightful what we you know what we do because you know we're very new to this as well. This is the first year we've done this project. Um so we're always learning every day and yeah, I'll open the floor to questions if anyone has any. What sort of um, awareness of that and, and impact is that in the initial research? What, what potentially might you, you know, when you make guides to try to address that, or even to educate people to what next modules they might have, go and buy the might be able to facilitate the effective. Um, Andrew, was it? Let's not use the word, word research. Uh, we collected data. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's a broader question. I don't think we've focused on that as much because we're more looking into the business and law faculty. And a deacon for people um, who are equity, uh, who are equity and access students, people who come from a low socioeconomic background, 
Deacon has programs so you could apply for scholarships to actually get a computer or you could have access, you could rent a computer from Deacon. There's a lot of uh, programs at Deacon like that. So we maybe in the future will work with those programs to raise actual awareness. Uh, but at the moment, we haven't actually thought much about it. Yeah, I think definitely, I think there's always going to be that digital like literacy gap. I think one thing we're trying to do with the guard is make it based on knowledge levels. And so it's not, it's not really, it's not really like a, one guide for everyone but it's more like beginner intermediate advanced so you kind of pick where you're at and you can kind of go from there i think um i think that's you know it's it's been a not so much what we're focused on in our recent in our you know data collection but i think the university as a whole has looked at you know how how are we gonna keep the equity there if some students really want to use ai they can use it intensely for their learning but some students don't want to touch it at all and they're relying on textbooks and things that might not be as efficient so i think it's a I think, you know, I think there's a push for more digital like literacy education, especially earlier on in university. Um, so I think it's something something that's that's slowly happening. Um, and I think as for awareness, we're still figuring out how to actually reach students um, because one of the most effective ways to actually reach students is, is social media. But if for somebody who doesn't have a digital presence, somebody who doesn't have as many digital devices or that access, it does, it's not going to help them. A lot of the students may not necessarily come on campuses. So where do we advertise? Where do we? So there's a lot of thought going into as that as well on ra raising awareness, not just for how to use AI, but other things as well. So I think yeah, we're still in the progress of learning how to do that. Any other questions? All right, I think we'll call it there. Thanks. <laughs>